Amen. Those, uh, everybody did great singing, a great job, and uh, y'all give the praise uh, team a hand one more time. Get untongue tied. I've got uh, great to see everybody here. I know summer sporadic. We've got uh, just a pop quiz. I love pop quizzes and questions. How many in this building have ever heard of a, uh, a singing group by the name of KC and the Sunshine Band? Anybody, I'm telling my age here. And uh, how, oh, hands down, how many of you actually have operated eight-track tapes? Anybody? Uh, okay, yeah. You know, I remember the first time I heard KC and the Sunshine Band on eight-track tapes and uh, in the 70s. And the reason I'm bringing them up is I've got my boogie shoes on. Okay, and uh, because I'm fisting to, we're fisting to have uh, continue with worship. We're opening the Word of God, so go ahead and head to Genesis, and uh, we've got to hit the road afterwards. Say a prayer for us. Uh, we've got uh, a lot of moving parts this summer. LOL is also stands for Love on Lafayette. It's a, a very organized mission trip we've been to before. Uh, we've got 280 kids registered that we're going to be a part of a team of. Seven other churches, I believe, that will be ministering to these 280 uh, campers that will be that will be ministering to and helping. And also, of course, uh, announcement that I mentioned later that I forgot to get in the bulletin is we'll be taking up a love offering uh, for Lori Howard and Ashley Webb. They'll be headed to Nicaragua. Is that correct? Get the right country. And uh, so for a, a sports camp down there so that we've got a couple more Sundays to get that in. Uh, set something aside. They've also been taking up some different things. Lots of stuff happening. BBX was a hit. I'm so thankful for that. Uh, just a lot of people just uh, pouring into students. Uh, just went really, really well. And so we've got before us, just want to read verse 1 uh, here in Genesis chapter 41. And we'll get started when you hit rock bottom Lessons from the big house, which is a euphemism, a saying about from prison. Joseph is gone, 17 years old. He's gone to the pit. Now he's in prison. He's going to end up in the palace. And uh, so we're going to take, take off here in our text in Genesis chapter 40 and verse 1. And uh, get going here, get the right chapter. I want to begin reading with this verse the word of god says and it came to pass after these things that the butler and the baker of the king of egypt offended their lord the king of egypt let's keep reading and pharaoh was angry with his two officers the chief butler and the chief baker so he put them in custody in the house of the captain of the guard in prison the place where joseph was confined. Father, bless your word this morning. I know that we, we just see this story. We wonder, what, God, what can, how can, what can we hear from your word to our hearts this morning? That's what we want to know. We want to listen to your still small voice. We want to open your word and read it and glean from it. In Jesus' name, amen. I've got a quote in your uh, outline uh, and I have to give credit where credit is due. The first time I heard it stated, it was from Dr. Tony Evans, a preacher in Dallas. And sometimes God allows his people to hit what we call rock bottom. Sometimes to find out that Jesus is the rock at the bottom. He's the rock there. Sometimes we have to be put in, or allowed to be put in a situation where you're out of steam, you're out of gas, you're out of strength, and you're out of options. You have nowhere else to turn. Folks, when you have nowhere else to turn, turning to the Lord's a good thing. And sometimes running out of option where he's the only option, he needs to be our first option, not our last option. Amen? He needs to be the first place we turn, not the last place we turn. He needs to be the first one we call on, not the last one we call on. Some people have said it this way. They've said this. They said, well, all we can do is pray. Have you ever heard that when somebody's struck with cancer or somebody's lost this or somebody's lost that? Well, all we can, well, that should be the first option. That should be the first thing we do. And, I, and I've said it. I've been guilty of it. And I know what 
we mean when we say that? Well, all we can do is pray. Well, it means there, there's no other options. If the Lord, if there's going to be a solution to this, it's going to have to be the Lord. And so I hope and pray that you will uh, just, uh, again, dig in, uh, let the Word of God just uh, grab a hold of you this morning. And there, I call it the right time in the wrong place. And looking at this, God had allowed Joseph to be sold into slavery. He, brothers put him in the pit. God knew that these uh, Ishmaelite traders were going to come along. He knew that he was going to be sold into the house of Potiphar. He knew that, uh, that, he, that Potiphar's wife was a, a sex-crazed addict, uh, uh, addicted to all things uh, macho. And because Joseph, the Bible says all this, was a fine, good-looking young man. She had, as I put last Sunday, laid bedroom eyes on him. She, excuse me, God knew that she would cast a false accusation. We, t we talked about that a little bit last week, how, that, how do we respond as Christians when false accusations come our way? There will, if you serve the Lord with any venom or vigor whatsoever, there will be false accusations that come your way. God was in control, and we seemed, it seems as if, of course, bad timing, accusations, and all this uh, came to pass, and so uh, here, the, here he is in jail, and I want to just draw your attention back to chapter 39, the Joseph's, the way he behaved, his patience is seen in G Genesis chapter uh, 20, 39, verse 21, the Word of God says this, but the Lord was with Joseph and showed him mercy, and he gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. And the keeper of the prison coming, committed to Joseph's hand all the prisoners who were in prison. Whatever they did, there was, it was his doing. The keeper of the prison did not look into anything that was under Joseph's authority. He had such confidence in Joseph. Again, at the end of verse 23, because the Lord was with him, and whatever he did, the Lord made it to prosper. Now, if you skip on down, remember there's no chapters and verses. You're in, into chapter 39, straight into chapter 40. When the Bible was written, in verse 3 and 4, which I've already read verse 3. So he's in jail, he has charge of all these prisoners, and notice here, these political prisoners, and by the way, there's such things as political prisoners in the United States, people that are sent to prison because of, of uh, their stance for the government, crimes against the government, the stance against the government. Here's the same way the Pharaoh puts these two guys just because he didn't like the way they did whatever. Verse 3, I'm in chapter 40, verse 3. So he put them... Pharaoh did, in the, in, then the guard, or the, basically the warden, put these two guys in Joseph's custody. So he put them in custody of the house of the captain of the guard in the prison, the place where Joseph was confined. And the captain of the guard charged Joseph with them, and he served them so that they were in custody for a while. All of this uh, is seen in Joseph's life. And then I made this allusion to this part in that all the way back to 37, whenever we find out Joseph's 17. And next week, we're going to get to where Joseph is 30 years old. So 13 years later, he goes from the pit where the brothers threw him into Potiphar's house, a bunch of peas here, into the prison and then later on into the palace, and we'll see that later. The whole time, God is in control. Also, when I think of Genesis 37, I'm also thinking Joseph had a dream. He had a dream that one day he would be, so to speak, over his brothers, and not only over his brothers, but over his mom and dad. And he would, and it's going to happen. We're going to see that. 
So what is my take on all this? So that's all, going all the way back to chapter thir Genesis 37. So my take on this is, again, what's the title of today's message? When you hit rock bottom, lessons from the big house. <laughs> By the way, he's about to say it a little bit later on. He'll say, hey, the, because the butler's going to uh, get out. The baker's going to be, <laughs> sorry, he's going to die, okay? And uh, so butler's getting out, and he says, hey, by the way, when you, when you get back to your boss's house, tell him about me because I am in here and I'm innocent. Well, that's a lot of people say that in prison. In prison. You know, what are you doing in here? Well, I'm innocent, okay? Everybody says that that's in prison. I'm innocent, okay? Guess what? Joseph said it and it was true. <laughs> He's in there on false pretenses and false charges, but God had him, again, what I call this first part, it looks like bad timing or bad location, but it actually was God's timing, and it was the right location. How can you and I learn to be content when life goes sideways? Can you and I remain faithful to God and act like Christians when life goes sideways? How can you and I be faithful to God and true to his word when life goes sideways. Life is going to go sideways on you. And again, most of the sideways that happened in Joseph's life was out of his control. It was in God's control. All right? Move on to the second point, Joseph and his compassion. So there's about to hear these, uh, about to have some dreams here. So all of a sudden, God's providence in timing and care, he's in the in the hand. These two guys that are in there for correct charges, the butler and the baker. Let's pick it up in verse five. The butler and the baker of the king of Egypt, who were confined in the prison, they had a dream. Both of them, each man's dream, in one night, in each man's dream, with its own interpretation. And Joseph came in in the morning, and he, of course, remember, he's in charge. He's helping them out. He's kind of the, uh, the underling of the warden, if you will. And he looked at them. He saw in verse 6 that they were sad. Verse 7, and he asked, so he asked Pharaoh's officers who were with him in the custody of his Lord's house, saying, what in the world is going on with y'all? You are so, y'all are upset. Verse 8. And he said to them, we've each had a dream. There's no interpreter of it. So Joseph said to them, do not interpretations belong to God. Tell them to me, please. So he's already, Joseph has already had experience with dreams. And, and, um, and so I'm and just talking about this and just helping out the, uh, the chief butler. This very interesting, and we've seen it over and over but especially here in prison, when life has kicked me in the rear end, <laughs> let me how I say it. I don't know if y'all have ever experienced life kicking you in the rear end. I'm trying to paint paint this as much as PG as possible. I really don't feel like helping other people. I really don't feel like being kind. Matter of fact, my flesh wants to take it out on somebody. Huh? You know, get a witness? Amen? I mean, I want to, re my flesh wants to react, and if life throws me a curveball and pushes me to the side and kicks me in the rear end, I really don't feel gracious toward others. But did y'all know this? This is true in the Bible. This is, now, this, this phrase is not in the Bible, but the principle is. Did y'all know that? Gratitude is an attitude, and it is a choice. Gratitude is an attitude, and your attitude is your choice. Matter of fact, even this, a lot of people have, have said this to me through the years. They said, and I've, I've had people come to me, they want to talk about, uh, so, yeah, Brother Michael, we need some counseling. Would you be willing to visit with me and my wife, me and my spouse, whatever? And I say, sure, we can meet at this time. And um, Brother Michael, we have fallen out of love. We just don't love each other anymore. We are, 
we believe that it's God's will for us to get a divorce. And I'm listening, I'm listening, and the whole time I know this, and I found this out especially in my early 20s when I was pastoring, is that basically they were coming to me hoping that the preacher would give them permission, you go ahead and get a divorce. But I've always been of this attitude is that because they'll say this, they'll say, we have fallen out of love with each other, but the Bible teaches that love is a choice and that you can choose to love someone and choose not to love someone. Matter of fact, there's a great deal. Uh, uh, it came out of one of the Kendrick Brothers movies, uh, Fireproof, and it's called The Love Dare. And it's a great deal on struggling marriages. That it, it Basically, it's an instruction booklet, step by step, how to love your spouse again. And uh, even if your spouse returns no love towards you, how should you respond? And how should you, I highly recommend it. Anybody in here, go to Amazon and get it. The love dare, okay? It's how to choose to love your spouse, especially when they will not reciprocate that love back to you. Jesus said it this way. Jesus said, love your enemies and this is my country version, and those people who are mean to you. Love your enemies and those people who are mean to you. I really don't want to. <laughs> he didn't say, there's not a, a sub-passage in there that says, well, if you want to, if you would be so kind as, if you, when the days you feel like it, there's not many days I feel like loving mean people, okay? I'll just tell you honest, there's not really many days that I feel like loving mean people. But again, attitude is a, a gratitude is an attitude, and attitude is a choice, and so is love. Joseph was a compassionate guy. He was in prison on false pretenses, and even while in prison, what did he do? How can I help you? I remember the first time that I was, uh, the light bulb came on. There's, I've had a lot of light bulb moments, Miss Paula, that just pops up. And she, by the way, Swaggy P, she's going with us to LOL. And uh, there's Art, over Art again. Okay, so same thing you did here. And, you know, and I remember I saw in Walmart, they've got those blue vests, the people that work at Walmart. First time I saw on the back of their, and I said, that's awesome. I'm a pastor of a church, and you know what's on the back of the, I don't know if they still are. I'm guessing they still are. On the back of those Walmart vests that the workers wear, says, how can I help you? On the back of the Walmart, I think it still is. But anyway, I said, I need a bunch of those for church members, okay? <laughs> and all the church members, when they get to church, put that on or wear a T-shirt. How can I help you? How can I pray for you? And I mean, have a servant's heart. And here's Joseph in prison and he's saying to these two guys, these political prisoners, how can I help you? What an attitude. An attitude that I need. The pastor of this church said, I need. I need to have a servant's attitude. I need to have a servant's heart. And here's Joseph with the same thing. So he's helping the chief butler. His dream is in verse 9 through 11. Pick it up. The butler's going to have a dream. It's going to be good. I hate to give you a spoiler alert. The baker's dream is going to be bad. <laughs> so let's get after it. And uh, so verse 9, the chief butler told his dream to Joseph and said, Behold, in my dream was a vine. Verse 10, and the vine were three branches, and it was as though it budded, and its blossoms shot forth, and its clusters brought forth ripe grapes. Then the Pharaoh's cup was in my hand, and I took the grapes, and I pressed them into Pharaoh's cup, and I placed the cup, in, and that's called fresh-squeezed grape juice. Amen. <laughs> and Joseph said to him, well, I know what the interpretation is in verse 12. The three branches are three days, and within three days the Pharaoh will lift up your head and restore you to your place. And you will put Pharaoh's cup in his hand according to the back whenever you were first had your job. End of verse 13. Verse 14, Joseph interjects. He says, you're getting out, buddy. You're getting out of here. You get to go back to your job. You get to go out. And said, by the way, footnote, I wrote down on a notebook piece of paper. Here, hand this to your boss. Verse 14. 
This is my country version of it. But remember me when it is well with you, and please show kindness to me, and make mention of me to Pharaoh, and get me out of this house. For indeed, I was stolen away from the land of the Hebrews, and also I have done nothing here that I should be put in this dungeon. Well, that's a great dream. What was his dream? Three days you getting out of here. It's kind of like I love, I've, I've watched a bunch of them through the years, TV, you know, breakout shows and, uh, you know, people that are breaking out of prison. And uh, matter of fact, one in the 70s, I keep going back to the 70s, Hogan's Heroes. And uh, they were always breaking in and out of the prison in World War II. And, uh, of course, Shawshank Redemption and other shows like that, and they're breaking out of prison. And here he is. You don't even have to break out. You're getting out of jail, okay? You're getting out of jail. It's great news. Unfortunately, well, well, well. the baker's sitting over there saying, if he got a great news, I can't wait to hear the interpretation of my dream. It says that he was so excited. Look at verse uh, 16. And when the chief baker saw that the interpretation was good and he said to joseph hey i had a dream i had a dream i was also in my dream and there were three white baskets on my head in the uppermost basket were all kinds of baked goods for the pharaoh and the birds ate them out of the basket on my head by the way this is about to go to uh pg-13 in the bible real quick right here verse 18 and so Joseph answered and said, this is the interpretation. The three baskets are three days. Yeehaw, three days. But within three days, verse 19, the Pharaoh will lift, up, lift off your head from you and hang you on a tree, and the birds will come land on there and pluck your eyeballs out. Can you rewind that? <laughs> Can you, like, give me a, is there a, it's kind of like uh, asking the doctor, is there a second opinion in the house, anybody? But there's not a second opinion with this guy, because that's exactly what was going to happen. And his interpretation was bad news for him, which, you know, we don't know the rest of the story, as, as the news commentator used to say it. We don't know exactly what all happened. Of course, he's setting up with the butler the butler's going to help Joseph get out of jail. And lastly, in this last part of this message, I, I wanted to jump through their dreams. There was a good one and a bad one, right? That's good news and bad news. Matter of fact, uh, I do this to Miss Karen all the time. I'll go up to Miss Karen. I'll say, do you want the, I've got good news and bad news. Miss Karen, what do you want first? The bad news. Because she likes to end on good news. If, you, if somebody comes to you and says, I've got good news and bad news, how many of you want the bad news first? Okay, hands down. How many of you like good news first? A few of you? Okay. We want, we want to end good, right? And a lot of us do that. And I could do that even this morning. I've got good news and bad news. Y'all want the bad news first? Okay. Yeah, this means yes. Okay. <laughs> and... Uh, so I want the bad news is is that we're all broken sinners before a holy and righteous God. The good news, Jesus Christ paid your entry into heaven. And he's bl his blood covers all your sins, every mess up you've ever had in your life. And he rose from the grave so we could live forever with him that's the good news but sometimes while you're living on this side of eternity here's the hard part it's called waiting waiting how many of you in this room have stood in line two to three hours to ride one ride anybody yeah how many of you you say it's worth it Anybody? Oh, yeah. It's worth it sometimes to ride that ride, depending on, on what not. And, of course, the, the biggest thrill ride I've ever done, matter of fact, was June of 2020 during COVID. And uh, my daughter right there and my other son went skydiving in Clarksville, Arkansas. And that was, a, that was adrenaline rush. And it was worth the wait to get up to 10,400 feet. 
So let's see about this waiting. Speaking of waiting, it didn't go well. So verse uh, 20, let's pick it up there. And it came to pass on the third day, which was Pharaoh's birthday, that he made a feast for all his servants. And he lifted up the head of the chief butler and the chief baker among his servants. Then he restored the chief butler to his butlership again, and he placed the cup in Pharaoh's hand. <laughs> Great news. Verse, but 22, he hanged the chief baker as Joseph had interpreted them. Look at verse 23. Uh-oh. But the chief butler did not remember Joseph, but forgot him. Yesterday, I had a phone call from our former student pastor, uh, Rob Cox, and uh, he was calling me as he was driving a bus, actually as he was about to get on the bus, to go pick up a mission team that was landing at the Atlanta airport. And he says, Brother Michael, I'm calling you to catch back up on my text. I noticed a week ago that you left a question in your text. I've done it, and you've done it. And by the way, just remember the tip that if, if you send Brother Michael a question and he doesn't respond, something happened, and I read it, put it down, the blue dot went away, <laughs> send me a question mark later if I don't answer within a certain amount of time. And he says, I realized I've left you hanging all week. I was asking about uh, Haley, Joe, and Rowan. And sometimes we forget, don't we? It's in the Bible. <laughs> People forget. He says, I'll remember you. He gets out. Does he remember? Let's look at some verses real quick. Oh, head to Psalms. I just picked out a few. And then I want to end in uh, just the, one of my favorites in the book of Lamentations. But in Psalms chapter 27 and verse 14, there's a bunch of weights. I just picked out a handful. In Psalms 27 and verse 14, the word of God says this, wait on the Lord. Be of good courage, and he shall strengthen your heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. As a kid growing up, one of the longest time periods of waiting is waiting on December the 25th. Santa Claus is coming. You see all those presents shows up? Then there's pre-presents. I mean those that show up before he does, okay? You know, I have to wait then sometimes parents will give in and say, you can open one on Christmas Eve. Okay, waiting is hard. This says it's a good thing, it's a good discipline to have. Flip over a couple of pages to Psalm 37 and verse 7. The Word of God says this, Rest in the Lord and wait patiently for Him. Do not fret because of Him who prospers in His way. Because of the man who brings wicked schemes to pass. You see a bad guy in a movie. Have you ever noticed how in the writers, I know a good movie, I like suspense and I like action. The more bullets and car chases that's in a movie, the better it is. Amen, can I get a witness? Men, okay? And uh, bullets and car chases. But, but a good writer, a script writer, makes you dislike and almost hate the villain. I mean, I want him to get what he's got coming because he's, got, he's caused pain, he's hurt somebody, he's killed somebody that we love in the movie. You know, in the Bible, the Word of God says that we, our flesh, we want to see justice. And we hate it when the bad guys are winning. We hate that. And he says there, wait on the Lord. I don't want to wait. I want justice now. And Hollywood took off with that one, too, usually with vigilante people <laughs> uh, in some sort of movie and different things. like. But waiting is a trait that we all need to work on. In Psalm chapter 40, in verse 1, it says, I waited patiently for the Lord, and he inclined to me, and he heard my cry. That up there, you know what that means? He heard my prayer. While you're waiting, do you hit your knees in prayer? Yes, you do. And then the last one, speaking of waiting, is way over here past Jeremiah. Jeremiah is known as the, the weeping prophet. And right after that, the lamentation of Jeremiah. 
because he didn't know much success in his ministry, but he was faithful to what the Lord had for him. And he had to learn to wait. In Lamentations chapter 3, beginning with verse 14, the Word of God says this, Now he's speaking of himself, I've become the ridicule of my people, their taunting song all the day. He has filled me with bitterness. He's made me drink wormwood. Basically this, you're so distraught, you've got an upset stomach. You're so worried and upset that you can't eat. And inside it feels like a pit is inside your stomach. Verse 16, he's broken my teeth with gravel. He's covered me with ashes. All refer to mourning. All refer to heaviness. Verse 17, he's moved my soul far from peace. I have forgotten prosperity. And I said, my strength and my hope have perished from the Lord. Remembering my affliction and roaming the wormwood and the gall, my soul still remembers and sinks within me. Now, it's this and a change in verse 21. Everybody in this room, whether you're talking about the C word, cancer, whether you're talking about the waiting for the outcome of a test or, or, or the a surgery, whether you're talking about, uh, I'll never forget one time whenever, of course, my, a lot of people in this room know my proneness passing out. I was pastoring my first church in Castor, Louisiana, and one of the church members was injured in an automobile accident emergency and the seat belt caught him and it, it hit so hard there was no airbag in his vehicle but he had a seat belt on but it tore a bunch of his intestines and they did emergency surgery and I was there and I'm the pastor I'm single pastor and I'm listening to the doctor surgeon comes out right after the emergency surgery he's going to be okay but he also did a really good job of describing the surgery that he just performed and it was all good news and they turned around and they said brother michael will you lead us in a prayer of thanks brother michael brother michael i was hugging the cold towel in the emergency room waiting room and the towel felt so good because i had i felt passing out and i caught myself but they were they were wait i remember i was with them waiting for the surgeon to come out is can be stressful waiting for the surgeon to come out can be stressful it's about to change look so my i'm remembering verse 20 verse 21 this i recall to my mind therefore i have hope through the lord's mercies we are not consumed because his compassions fail not they are new every morning the lord is my portion Therefore, I hope in him. The Lord is good to those who wait for him. I'm going to back up. I'm just going to end right here. I know I put some other verses in here for you. Listen to me very closely. This morning, if you don't have verse 24, go ahead and pop 24 back on the screen. I think Gunner's back there. Look at that. If, if that's not you, I don't know how you're going to make it. How many of you this morning can say, the Lord is my portion? The Lord is my portion. When, you know what I mean? Because when I'm waiting, the Lord is my portion. And when he says this, I recall to my mind, it means I remember when he got me through that in 1974. I remember when he got me through that in 2004. I remember when he got me through that last year. And he got me through whatever you want to name. And you know the reason that God got you through that? Because the Lord is your portion. The, and therefore, if the Lord is your portion, you can finish the verse. Therefore, I hope in him. It means this, my confidence is in him. My, my soul, my faithfulness, my want to, my desire, my ambition is what is in him. This I recall to my mind. What, the wormwood, the bitterness, and the gall, but I had it four years ago. I had it eight years. I had the wormwood, the bitterness, and the gall back 
whenever. You remember whenever God got you through the wormwood, the bitterness and the gall? Wormwood refers to something that you, makes you want to puke, makes you want to sick your stomach. The wormwood makes you want to turn and run. It's fear, it's anxiety. The wormwood, the bitterness and the gall. I recall to my mind, God got me through that. And then I had to land on that verse right there. I pray this morning, that the Lord is your portion. It was Joseph's portion while he's in prison. That's the reason he could smile while locked up. That's the reason he helped people while locked up. That's the reason that even later on, the butler forgot him, and he's still rocking. I pray that the Lord is your portion. Father, as we bow our head and we get ready to, to respond to whatever you're leading, whatever may be on our heart this morning, Lord, I pray that we would respond according to your direction. I pray that some words that I've stated this morning from your scripture ring, rings true in somebody's heart this morning. Lord, I know that you're in control. We need to recognize that. We need to trust you, even with everything that we can't understand, even when we see no other options. Dear Lord, help us to lean on your strength, lean on you, to trust you, and to call upon you this morning. We love you and praise you. In Jesus' name.